Okay, so we're going to be reading on world peace, chapter three, by Rav Yudha Ashlag. Um, the article is on precept, chapter three. Global spirituality and local spirituality. It has been 12 years now since I started working on a manifesto that will serve as a solid foundation. And for this purpose, after toiling and finding, I am here by reading it to you. What has brought me to this is my great devotion to the idea. And because I have assumed in advance, it is not sustainable without a basis in religion. And there has never been throughout history a major push of the masses, such as nationalism or law and order, without this basis, not to mention the issue of letting go of private property. Moreover, we do not have any higher or more exalted concept, and yet this is accepted only by wise people of clear mind, and not at all by those of crude materialism and by the masses. As for them, without private property, they don't find any motive power for voluntary bodily movement in a direct manner, but only in an indirect manner, meaning in a roundabout manner, which is a very weak method for success and is bound to fade away completely. Because through compulsion, not only is their work incomplete, but also we need supervisors and guards to keep watching over them, at least one for every hundred people. And this here is the crux of the problem, literally where the dog is buried, because the culture of our generation is not yet high enough that it would give us the one in a hundred people who has a heart of wisdom and pure consciousness. And then the guarantor needs to be guaranteed because even the supervisor needs motive power for the work of supervision, which is something he has not. In general, I have nothing to offer except for the one precept whose reward is infinite true cleaving, which is described as no eye has seen a God besides the Isaiah 64, 3. And this is the precept of work and of sharing with the community and of adding additional benefit to them on top of any benefit they already enjoy. And the reward will be according to the effort. And exactly opposite to this, there is only one sin, which is egoism also in a more narrow sense, meaning that any self-enjoyment is a transgression. Therefore, anyone who decreases this transgression receives his reward as payment from his maker, meaning that a person should not enjoy anything in this world except to the extent he shares with the community and with the Creator in order to make the Creator and the people happy. And any drop of enjoyment exceeding this degree is a transgression. And this nefesh, lower soul, will be completely severed from human society and would reincarnate as a wild animal. All this unless the person atones for the sin and would be put to work against his will. And of course, these things concerning one precept have to be in the form of working for the sake of the Creator and not for the community. Meaning that the Creator has provided us with ways to give him pleasure. He has prepared a community for each individual and a cardinal rule that a person should serve his community and be useful to them. And the Creator accepts this work and this pleasure as if it, the same degree of benefit and pleasure, was sent directly to him by members of his world. Here we need to expand the explanation regarding reward and punishment to the level that fits the masses. But the main point is the necessity of the wise to understand it, because only the understanding of the wise leaders establish and supports the deeds of the masses. I have worked on them for 12 years until I have managed to edit them with a deeper sense and deeper reasoning than any of the theology and mysticism of all those that came before me, as our eyes shall observe. And in order to declare it thoroughly, you should send to me a group of wise people who are well versed with your system and let them examine and find out. To explain this, I have prepared two approaches. One way follows theoretical theology, as is common up to the present in all matters. And the second way is according to mysticism, based on things that have been recognized by the wise of yore over the past few thousand years. And here, events of our time have paved the way so that it is possible to publicize this opinion of mine to the world. I'm referring to the various peace associations that have pro proliferated in the world at this present time. Through this desperate yearning for peace, the world is able to accept my opinion, although I'm afraid that they may take this opinion of mine and cover it with a cloth of egoism, in which case it would bring a curse rather than a blessing. Therefore, I cannot stray from my initial thoughts because I have labored and written this manifesto only for you. And now it is really like cold water sprinkled on a tired soul, as I can see by your present state. In regard to financial issues and all that pertains to material property, it is mandatory not to make changes on any account, for there is no difference between people 
between the black and white and the yellow, between the wise and the foolish. They are all equal, and each is obliged to give to the world as much as he or she can, receiving what he or she needs without prejudice, prejudice or favoritism. This is an absolute law. As for the spiritual and intellectual properties that do no harm to the economy or to material happiness, namely united ideals and legalities, as well as political reasoning, ethics and aesthetics, all these should remain national, that is, local. No nation should be forced to forego its customs and preferences as long as it will not harm at all the customary straightforward laws of the economy. In a word, material internationalism should be meticulously maintained and alongside it, spiritual nationalism should be preserved as long as it does not impact, literally touch, material internationalism. My advice, therefore, is that everywhere within your borders, the secular and religious alike must accept the national and international religion, like I suggested. Whoever transgresses or weakens it is punishable as if you were harming humanity. This is the divine international religion that every human being is ordered to fulfill. Otherwise, he will be uprooted from the world to come, and he will lose both worlds. Indeed, God allows every nation to keep its religious customs that were received by the great sages. Each country, according to its preferences and spirit, since undoubtedly they would help any individual country to its liking. Eventually, all nations will be able to completely accept the international religion that is lofty and above them all, the prophetic last word. Whoever denies this principle, his religion is damaged and harmful and will deserve a severe punishment and should be prevented from this harmful attribute. Yet a person who accepts our principle will find that his individual religious work becomes acceptable because it is necessary that it be validated in order to finally help the international religion. In a word, individual religion must be constructed in such a way that it would be just a tool to reach the universal religion. If it becomes known that some countries are damaging again what they have corrected before, and individual religion became the most important ultimate goal, they would be punished and the religion would be completely forbidden by law. Do not ask what the benefit would be if we start cutting back religions and war is restored. Indeed, God can change any religion. And with a carefully planned design, this international faith can be fully brought into the midst of the masses when God annuls all the additions that, he re that the middle class added to the religion for their own benefit. He revealed this to its prophets to ease the work and toil that the middle class deceitfully came up with for their own advantage. Surely there would be some clear-minded among you who would say, we have already managed to uproot a great amount from the masses. Shall we, become, shall we be messengers now to return ignorance to its place? Be careful of being extreme. Do not quickly make poor people wealthy, both materially and in knowledge. First, we should fix the international economy using all the tools in our hands, since the end justifies the means, especially a sacred, difficult to realize goal such as this. After we arrange the economy throughout the world, we can take our time uprooting deviant opinions from the world. First, we need to create healthy bodies. Then we can start taking care of good souls for those bodies. It is a law of nature that one's will is not to be broken because of someone else's will, but only because of one's own will. Even when a weak person surrenders his will to someone more aggressive than him, he does so because of his own desire to protect himself from pain and so forth. It is a psychological law that there is no will that can be broken while being the only will working and dominating. Whenever anyone's will is broken anywhere in the world, it happens only because its owner has attached another will to it. And when the two wills are standing in the same place, it is inescapable that they will wear and erode each other. And in doing so, their form is blurred and their force is lost. I'm mentioning this because I find that you are not focusing your work on manifesting your goal. On the contrary, you keep adding various other things you want without noticing whether these drain your energy or add confrontations and resistance. This is the greatest evil and history will never forgive you for this crime and malice. So why in these difficult times do you fight something that is not directly necessary for your goals? This is nothing but foolishness and lack of attention to your role. Therefore, if you are fighting religion and nationalism because they directly hinder your goal, this is reasonable and acceptable. However, if you are fighting religion and nationalism when they do no direct harm to your goal, this is a crime and evil-mindedness. It is like a poor man who hardly earns enough money for bread and water but spoils all his earnings by buying wine and drinks, and by doing so, fades away and dies. It is not enough for you in your difficult war, which is your main focus, and is entirely against the nature of man, when you are part of the masses to work and toil without any motivation, and this, is war, and this war 
not enough that you add fuel to the flame by also fighting at the same time against religion and nationalism? Is there a greater foolishness in the world than this? The main thing is that you will perish very quickly and therefore you are stepping backwards and your work is bearing curse. The truth is that until now you had no other choice because these two ways present the most terrible opposition to your method according to the nature that they have received from the Borgies middle class. But in the manner that I have laid my method before you, religious not only does not oppose and damage you, but it is the most effective assistant and is also the only instrument that ensures the success of your goal in the most uplifting manner. As for nationalism, my opinion is that it's better if it were to be corrected. It should be given proper character, one that will be accepted by the masses before it is completely uprooted and fought against. Surely the most I can do to you it is to present you with a successful mechanism to obtain the goal. But the work and trouble themselves are all upon you to find a suitable plan and to supply it with swift and loyal legs to spread the word quickly. If this is acceptable to you, let me know or send me more suitable people. Then we can work out a successful plan to ensure swift expansion. So what are your thoughts? I'm not sure as far as uh, the length of his uh, regular writings, but it seemed to be at least a medium-sized writing, and there seemed to be a lot of uh, material where uh, he compares uh, uh, nationalism and religion and how to resolve uh, that issue within the world, because he was talking about the different organizations that have sprung up. Uh, I don't know uh, what organ may have been talking about the UN by then. I don't know what year it was written, but uh, I think it's a good uh, essay on uh, how things need to proceed. It was written in 1933. Well, it wasn't the UN. Uh, it must have been maybe some other European group that... Uh, was collaborating together in 1930. That was right before the war, several years before the Second World War. I gotta tell you, uh, one thing I like was uh which actually kind of hit me a little bit today was uh, you can fight religion only if it's if it's gonna harm you on your way to the goal, but if it's gonna not harm you on the way to the goal, then it'd be foolish to do that. But you still have a right if it would harm you towards the goal, you know. And that's um, okay. Oh no, Patricia, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'd like to go back to the two evils. The one about um, enjoying, that it was, is a transgression to enjoy, um, uh, to enjoy anything. I don't know if it's talking about in the, the corp, on a corporal level, except for when you're doing, um, you know, for the work's sake. And then I'd like you to read that again if you can. And also the greatest evil, um, that you were saying with, with the wills. I don't know if it was say, talking about trying to change another's will or the battle of the wills. That, was, that one was said to be the greatest evil. Right, so he, he talked about, with the will, he talked about how um, uh, if a person wills is broken is because the person itself has a broken will because he has two desires basically clashing with each other and they break. So when you have two people fighting, the only reason why one gives up is precisely because the other person's desire is broken into two desires. And then the first person makes it exposing that breakage in his desire. So it's not like you have two forces, one against each other and one breaks because of the pressure of the other, but rarely, rather the pressure of the first is revealing the broken in the second. So it's one person with two broken will. It's one person with two broken wills, and the other person can break the person's will because they have two two wills that are broken. 
exactly it's revealing it it's it's like when you right. have um uh you know sometimes it can happen when uh you're putting pressure on something and then it breaks. It breaks because it previously had a crack in it or um, it was ready to break at that specific uh, place. So when you're putting pressure on something, it breaks at some point and not others because it's already broken then you're just revealing its breakage. I've been thinking about it. I want to hear the whole article and let me know if you have it in a place where we can read it and I apologize for my tardiness but the conversation I had right before I got in here was explaining to my daughter we when we become aware of something and we can see that we don't understand it we step outside and ask for the answer from that source and we don't act until we get the answer. But knowing that you're tapping into the answer that is for creation and not the answer that is for self is important. And what you're hitting on is that I think there are a whole lot of people that have observed the rules and are using them for themselves instead of for creation but i don't know that that's where i'm heading um it was designed again to actually bring us to this power to bring us to this um internal power but it was used for filling instead it was used as a safety net as a tranquil um as a basically uh, a way to give people safety and uh tranquilism and um and basically death because instead of if you don't use it to get to the goal then you're using it to plateau to relax and not reach the goal so question because that is the the latest last five years of conspiracy people when you hear them saying peace and safety peace and safety it's when you should run and they are interpreting it on a service to corporeal self uh, many of them and so now it's expanding in my head how to help them flip that switch by being the light for them. And when you're discussing fighting, it has a different connotation in my brain is that the, sometimes the best way of fighting is not fighting and letting itself implode. But I would love to hear that article again at some point. I don't want to take everybody else's time, so I'm, I'm really full of back now that I missed the first 10 minutes. I'm so sorry. First, I'll be uploading it so you're able to hear it um, when I upload it anyway. Thank you. Um, I have a question, um, the article. Um, it, it mentioned about uh, nationalism and religion, and um, I don't remember if the article um, scrutinized whether, like, how our attitude should be um, toward nationalism and religion. Um, so, what should I mean? Uh, should should we have a certain attitude or a certain um, uh, like a uh, attitude toward nationalism or are, are, are we above it below it or do we work with it do we conflict it or is it all relative so I'll read um, a paragraph from actually chapter 5 where it says the mistake in abandoning nationalism here we can see the great mistake in principle in abandoning nationalism because successful internationalism completely depends on successful nationalism as mentioned earlier because everything is necessary, nothing is harmful, except that we need proper regulations and education. It's all good if it's just with the right intention. Everything's great. But if it's, we all have to, always have to direct things to the creator. Now, who was talking about also an international religion and how about leaving, how uh, through the 
individual religions, I guess, by country and traditions, that they shall lead lead us into an international religion. I think he was talking about that also, which was nice, you know? And it's funny because this was written in 1933. Um, this is long before, you know, this is just before the Second World War. It's um, uh, before the, you know, economy was worldwide, um, before internet. Um, so it's actually easier for us to grasp on these ideas now, but then it was like, you know, totally new. Um, he was really before his time. Um, and we can see today that, you know, we're all from different parts of the country and parts of the world. Um, but yet we're all coming together for a single goal, for a single religion, you could say. But it's a, it's a, it's an international religion, not a national religion. So it's something that goes above. It's something that can unite us all no matter where we're from. And he's, he's basically saying that we need both the locality and the, the, globe, the global um, effect as well. And that the global will only work because you have the local. And we can see how um, all our material concerns are dealt with on the local. Um, and then in between, you've got that global um, effect. You know, it used, to be that, it used to be that companies were in countries. But now countries are in companies. So you'll have a company which um, will span multiple continents and multiple countries and um, it doesn't really matter which country you're in, it matters which company you're in. And we can see that going from a more physical concept of a country, which is basically a physical concept since it's based by boundaries of physical land, going to a company, which is going more to a concept, more to a, a spiritual, a thought concept, where there's no actual physicality behind that company, apart from saying, oh, the main base might be in a certain country, but that's about it, and everyone works together in multiple countries to serve the company's goal. And you can see that's a stepping stone for this international company, which would be to serve the creator, to you know, reveal our internal power. That would be the product. That would be the product that we would be selling. And everyone could join that, co that company. Um, so you can see this movement from uh, physical land to spiritual land, which is desire. Actually, when you're reading this, or when I read texts like this, I bring it to my, myself, that I take the metaphor of it speaking of a country and the world, and I'm applying it to myself. So the nationalism is my uniqueness, and that must be retained, ma maintained and retained. And then I am inclusive in the whole with my uniqueness um, and that's basically what he's talking about but just in the metaphor of nationalism and the world affair totally agree totally agree um, and I was gonna just add on and making when it talks about healthy you know the healthy bodies uh, for each uh, unique one to um, to be strong and independent in its own self, you know, like, like all the cells, you know, of the body. I call this independent on each other, where um, we all know about the right line, which is dependent on each other. We're all dependent on each other, but what normally happens is that we basically drive ourselves into the ground because anytime anybody wants to go above and actually advance, they're like, hey, you've got to be all equal to us, stay on the ground, and then of course it derodes and, and, and loses its effect. On the other hand, you have the left line where it's, I'll be totally independent. I'll, you know, start up my own company. I don't need anybody. I can do it all by myself. And that doesn't last long either. And by making a middle line of that, which is independent on each other, I'm using each other to become independent. So the goal is to be independent, but we get there by being dependent on each other. I like what Laura said about um, in the uh, concept that was described uh, in the article about nationalism to its every level. Um, this concept of uh, like individual parts of 
being healthy and working for each other as one whole body. I kind of like that, uh, that concept. And it works on an individual level, on a global level, and the family. It works on every level. Noticed how um, he said at the beginning that he's been working for it for 12 years. Um, think of the dedication required to just focus on this whole concept of how am I going to make a method that will be acceptable? Um, and just working on all the different aspects of this method and only focusing on that. How old was he back in 1933? When was he born again? Um, what, was it 87? Let me see. He was born in Poland in, nine, in, 18, in 1886. I got a question. 47. That is young. Forty-seven, huh? I got a question. I, I think it applies to this article and it applies to BB teachings in general also. And I'm trying to word it, and I only know how to do this by giving an example. Is they've done studies on groups and how you have to obey the will of the group. And it was shown that the group chose to ignore the only person who had the key piece of information that they would have needed to survive. And the example was in Alaska. They actually had an Alaskan person in the group who had the only piece of information. If they had followed the group, they all would have died. So in light of that, there is a very fine delicate line we have to understand about this that is slowly ever so painfully slowly revealing itself i hope not just to me about the intentions behind the actions being critical and allowing the thought to be birthed or die through the process of nature. And anyone who can expand, or if you all think I'm whacked, it's okay, just tell me. I'm, I'm very much concerned with this article and placing it into its appropriate perspective. Um, we can actually see that also in movies and also in real life, um, the system tends to uh, choose singular people to do major changes. So, uh, you know, Armageddon, you know, the movie, like you have just one group and the whole of humanity is dependent on that one group to save them. It's like, why didn't you send three groups? No, we'll just send one. And it's like, uh, you know, um, you know, Adam Marie Sean or Abraham, what you, one guy, that's all you have to uh, teach this education. But what if he died? That would be it. Or Moses. Or, you know, you can look down the line, you can see that the creator only chooses like one in every generation. It's like the Ari. The Ari was only in, in Tzfat, he was only there for 18 months. All the literature we have from the Ari was 18 months, period. And he died. So, uh, and you know, Bala Salam, same thing. So we can see how the creator loves to choose one person um, in each generation um, to, to expose this. And it makes... It, 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 you could say it, the tension behind that actually enables the person to actually um, expose what he wants to expose. Um, it's the concept of um, uh, the creator puts a few righteous in each generation um, and they get to support the entire nation. Um, the difference is though that was until now, but now we're going to see a change where we're going to go from this singular, just one person coming down and now it's going to, explode into groups. It's going to become much more, you can have much more people reaching attainment. You can have much more people talking with each other. 
and it's going to be again much more international and it's going to be less local than it was before before it was local if you weren't in Sfat you wouldn't know about the Uri until many years later um, so you would have missed it if let's say you were you know in Europe or something like that um, but today we can see how not only are there more people which are becoming aware of the system but rather but also it's in multiple countries and um, we no longer have the border restrictions so you know we're now on a zoom meeting of multiple continents um, this is showing of the um, the Messiah of David path instead of which is bottom up instead of the Messiah of Yosef which is top down Put that on your list for a future class because I've been doing a lot of that's been hitting me at every corner is the what you just described the Messiah of David and the Messiah of Yosef and there's all these things that you're bringing up that are so many different lines coming into me that are working themselves out so help us with wise words words of guidance on focus when it's all blessing at you the only thing that came to me this morning is I have to wake up before my desires do so that I can put them in order and prioritize them to make the day the most powerful day it can be but it's true that's the difference between being reactive and active reactive is responding when your desires have hit you um, and active is um, doing the calculations and the work before the desires emerge. Um, that's one of the reasons why, you know, we're learning a lot in the system and getting loads of discernments. How do our desires emerge so that we can um, categorize them and deal with them accordingly before they actually just hit us? Um, it's like uh, preparing to, uh, you know, when you need the toilet and then you go to the bathroom. So you're like, taking it into account. And you're like, oh, I just need a toilet. It's like with kids, you see them while they just... Like they awaken at the last minute where if you don't take me to the bathroom, it's, you know, hell's going to break loose and they, they give you no preparation. Well, as adults, we actually have preparation. We're like, okay, I'm probably going to need to go to the toilet in three hours. I'll, I'll put that in my schedule. Um, I'm going to be hungry. So with kids, they're like, I'm hungry now. It's like, what, what, we just left the house. Why are you telling me now? It's like, well, only now did my desire of hunger emerge. So let's deal with it now. So you have to be reactive to that. While as adults, we're like, okay, I'll be hungry in five hours. I'll make sure I can go somewhere and actually get some food beforehand so I won't uh, be peckish. That's another class is the Abraham circumcising his desires, Noah placing the ones that he had made into the ark and letting the rest wash away. Do they wash away or are they for later to be cleansed? Are there some that wash away? When I circumcise them, is that the that book's definition of mating them and making them whole and then taking the ones you can't work with and sticking them in the file cabinet until you have enough understanding to work with them? Exactly. So the concept of circumcising and of the flood is when we're overloaded with, like the flood is when we're overloaded with desires and then we say, okay, stop. I'm going to put them all to the side. I'm going to deactivate them for the moment. I'll deal with them later. Let me first focus myself, work on what is the goal, how am I going to get there, and then I can start to reactivate them one by one and actually deal with them and not be overloaded by sensations of, you know, why is the creator doing it like this? Why is there killing in the world? And you just can get really um, locked into these thoughts and then you can't deal with them. The idea is you can get flooded. You can get you know, overloaded with all these discernments and the idea is to put them aside, close yourself in and say, okay, Let's clean ourselves first. Let's clean some concepts. And then we can start reawakening these, these, these questions of why is the creator working like this and why is the creator working like that? So let's tie this into the letter that you just read, which to me shows that we truly, do we have to cross the barrier before we can possibly make right decisions or can we allow the creator to work in us to make right decisions until we cross the barrier? Again, because we're dealing with power and not filling. So with filling, you know, 
I would, you know, someone would say to you, oh, yeah, only off the barrier were you suddenly able to work with it. But because it's power that you've got this gradual growth and therefore you can start seeing the changes of internal power even before you pass the barrier, um, you can uh, start to see yourself getting more and more focused on the path and getting out of that chaos where you're sort of constantly, you know, changing your, your direction to going to darkness where you're already more aligned, but you know you're not there. And then in the spirit where you're just like really close and you're like, I just need to put in that just much more intensity and depth of discernments to actually pass. So um, it, it's not where it's an on an off switch. It's more like a dimmer where slowly, you know, um, putting up the amount of energy we can handle, the amount of power we can handle. Um, and then passing the barrier is um, like a, uh, a gauge where, you know, when we pass it, we're a hundred percent in these discernments. We're hundred percent in our internal power. That's all we care about. Um, and we're, we're putting um, our internality uh, 100% above our externality. Um, and that's passing the barrier. So you can see this growth before and it's not like, oh, when you die, you get 72 you know, virgins. Um, you can actually see the growth in you as you continue cleaning your concepts and you know, going to the group and collecting those discernments. You'll see the growth in your internal power that will actually give you feedback that you're actually going in the right direction. I like the image. You said this before, and of course I put it into an image, um, but like the intention, it's broken. We have a broken intention. And the more it's corrected, as it becomes a corrected intention, then it's the masach. So then we're in spirituality. So as it's correcting, so do the thoughts and our actions and reasons behind the things that we do things is also correcting. So the more that gets corrected, the more the behavior, the thoughts, the reason also gets corrected. And so that would be the less external feeling, the more internal feeling. Exactly. Um, adding to what um, Laura was saying, it was more more a question. So, um, so basically, when we go through our our lives, you know, um, and uh, uh, you know, we have to um, be a certain way in our families, at work, in the community, in our relationships, um, and um, a lot of us, um, we, we we try to deal with these things on a corporal external level. And, and probably make a lot of mistakes or or not getting anywhere. But um, what I'm hearing is, um, and, and what I've learned from lessons and other people's discernments is that really what we should narrow our focus down is on the intention and, and, and correcting and building um, and growing the intention. Um, and, and all other actions after that, really um, it's kind of useless or, I don't know, help me to understand that. The funny thing is that if we take, you know, sometimes when we're like, oh, you know, if only, you know, I didn't have a wife or I didn't have the kids or didn't have work, I could focus more on my spirituality and, and I'd have more time for it. The funny thing is that sometimes when you do have time to yourself and there's no tension, you don't learn anything. And just the day goes by and you just waste it. So it turns out that because the tension of the environment that actually forces you to find the time to learn, but if you're just given it without that tension, you've just got nothing to push you forward. Like, why would I want to learn? You know, I've got time to myself. I've got tranquility. I've, you know, I've got what my broken intention wants, which is, you know, death, tranquility, sleep. Uh, why would I be going for this power stuff? But only when you have that tension, then you want the solution, which is internal power to able to handle that external tension. So we can actually see how the environment around us, that tension it gives us, is exactly and precisely what brings us to uh, advance and actually want to learn and be more with the friends and be more with the environment accordingly. So when you say tension, you mean tension meaning um, like stress or distress that the environment causes us? Um, exactly, exactly what do you, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's the, um, the pressure. We've got a pressure on our vessel and because of that pressure, that's why we came to Kabbalah in the first place. You know, no one, right. comes, no one comes to Kabbalah. Everyone comes to Kabbalah because of some kind of pressure. Either that's internal pressure, which means the point in the heart is pulsed, 
pulsing, or it's external pressure, that I'm being overloaded with tension and I don't know how to handle it, and someone said that maybe Kabbalah can help me. So you've always got this, it's always because of tension, we come to Kabbalah, either internal or external. Well, isn't that why people seek the creator and, and many religions? Because of the tension. Exactly. The thing is, though, that you can use the same method for two uh, ways. One is to um, annul yourself to the community, annul yourself to the religion, lower your desires, and then you get that sense of tranquility, that sense of relaxation, which is death. Or you can use your environment and grow out of it and actually get born out of the environment into spirituality. So you can either die inside the womb or actually uh, get born outside of it and then actually grow and, and, and become your own independent force, but still tied to that root. Earlier you were reading um, about reward according to the effort or something. Yes, the reward is, is by the effort. Um, the more um, you work and collect the discernments and, and spend time in the method, then the more you see the reward. It, it has a direct correlation between the effort and the result. Notice what it said at the beginning, and I'll just reread this part. As for them, without private property, they don't find any motive power for voluntary bodily movement in a direct manner, but only in an indirect manner meaning in a roundabout manner, which is a very weak method for success and is bound to fade away completely. Because through compulsion, not only is their work incomplete, but also we need supervisors and guards to keep watching over them, at least one for every hundred people. And this here is the crux of the problem, literally where the dog is buried, because the culture of our generation is not yet high enough that it would give us the one in a hundred people who has a heart of wisdom and pure consciousness. And then the guarantor needs to be guaranteed because even the supervisor needs motor power for the work of supervision which is something he has not. Um, I many times see in the society when uh, um, a new thing comes up, so a congress will come up or some activity or some dissemination. And at the beginning, everyone has motive power. Everyone's like, yeah, we're going to do this. It's going to be great. And then very quickly it, it dies down and then it's so much hard for people to keep it going. And that's why you'll see that constantly the society has to give new, um, uh, new experiences, new situations to just keep people going. Because if you, do something and you don't, if your motive power is not your internal power and in revealing it, then you're going to constantly need these external um, sensations to reawaken you and get you to uh, move again. Um, and the idea is once you have that internal power, then you don't need those external sensations. You can have a nice, boring day externally, but internally you're like empowered and you're thinking and while well, this is different, this can't be the same day as yesterday. It's like, yeah, but yesterday you did the same thing. You woke up in the morning, you heard the lesson, you... Uh, went to work, you eat, sleep, you know, you do the, all those things, you've done it all the time, but you know that you're getting totally different discernments each time, your, your, your growth is internal. So the world becomes black and white, it becomes mundane, and all the color goes internal. So then you don't need all these external sensations to waken you up all the time. You don't need a new Congress, you don't need a new dissemination, uh, suddenly new tens um, realignment to awaken you. You've got those awakening or, internally because of that internal power. That's why he references the middle class, because it was the middle class that um, is like the driving engine behind all the new uh, material capitalism and property owning, and that's all this external billing. I think part of the sessions that we're doing here is um, precisely to clean those concepts and give us the ability to see our growth. It's, it's, um, it's a science, it's, um, but the science is not about something outside of you. The science is yourself and you get to, and that's one of the advantages of having a group is that it gives you a laboratory to test things out. You, you learn a new concept and you go to the group and you, without even telling them because they've already agreed to be guinea pigs, you try it on them and you see what is the response. And, and that's where we can you know, become scientists. We, we learn about stuff. Um, Ralph says this many times. We're trying to be scientists. We're trying to learn stuff. Um, sometimes what happens is we read something and we immediately want to um, apply it full force. But you, know, you never do that. You always need to 
apply it slowly and see the results. And if it goes through, you continue putting in the needle. And if there's response, then you put it out. Um, and we can we can see that a lot happening with the group, where the group is a is a, a bunch of people coming together to become that laboratory to test on each other, and and test out these rules of of how we work as humans and and how we respond. Well, I'm wondering what that would look like. Like, what would it look like if you had 150? Not to take the number two literally, but if you're trying to say that one person can only really manage or maybe assist or aid a small number of people kind of curious how not horizontally but how laterally that would look i guess one of the things that uh, balasalam says in the introduction introduction of uh, panimi otomas virati talks about how in the future we will no longer learn from each other but we'll learn from the creator um, and i've said many times that this is showing that um that means we have to start learning from each other in order to learn from the creator and we can see that change um, especially in, in the neighborhood where previously only the rav would speak and everyone would just listen. And in the last few years, they've started the whole idea of workshops where it already gives people the ability to express themselves. So we're moving towards this point where we'll be teaching each other. And, um, and then it becomes more of a peer to peer model where, uh, you know, I help nine people, they help another nine people and they help another nine people. And then it spreads on. And it makes, instead of having a, a vertical model, where you've got one teacher teaching all the students that he has, no matter what the number is, rather we start teaching each other. And it, it becomes like the internet of the, the model of the internet, where um, we can talk to each other and it doesn't matter which group we're in, and we can affect each other and, uh, and clean uh, each other's discernments and concepts. Um, and I definitely see this is how it's going, where um, one person can empower another, and then that person will power another person who is not even connected to the first one. And that's what allows these groups to um, uh, rise up and start um, not being dependent on one individual. That if that individual dies, then all the groups disarray or they have to start raising that person from the dead uh, conceptually. Um, oh, he's still alive. He hasn't died yet. It just looks like he's dead. Um, but rather, the dependency can be on the groups themselves. So then you don't have that single point at the top. And that's the concept of the ego actually raising up to the end of correction, um, because it doesn't, it, it, all the points become their independence and you don't need some higher point doing all the work for them. Um, Zakai, just for clarity, um, is it possible to just kind of summarize the concept that, the concepts that were described in the article that you read? <laughs> so. Because I believe, like, I, I feel like I have a very superficial understanding of what we just read, very superficial. <laughs> um, I didn't make any summary. If you want, I can read it again, um, if that's what you want. Do you want me to read it again? Yes. Sure, sure, yes, if it's, if it's okay with everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, okay, let's read it again. What, what are we reading? I, I, didn't, I didn't get it the first time. Yes, yeah, so it's chapter three. Chapter three in one precept, global spirituality and local spirituality. It has been 12 years now since I started working on a manifesto that will serve as a solid foundation. And for this purpose, after toiling and finding, I'm here by reading it to you. What has brought me to this great devotion to the idea, and because I've assumed in advance that it's not sustainable without a basis in religion, and there has never been throughout history a major push of the masses, such as nationalism or law and order. Without this basis, not to mention the issue of letting go of private property. Moreover, we do not have any higher or more exalted concept, and yet this is accepted only by the wise people of clear mind, and not at all by those of crude materialism and by the masses. As for them, without private property, they don't find any motive power for voluntary bodily movement in a direct manner, but only in an indirect manner meaning in a roundabout manner, which is a very weak method for success and is bound to fade away completely. Because through compulsion, not only is their work incomplete, but also we need supervisors and guards to keep watching over them, at least one for every hundred people. And this here is the crux of the problem, literally where the dog is buried. Because the culture of our generation is not yet high enough that it would give us the one in a hundred people who has a heart of wisdom 
and pure consciousness. And then the guarantor needs to be guaranteed because even the supervisor needs motive power for the work of supervision, which is something he has not. In general, I have nothing to offer except for the one precept whose reward is infinite, true cleaving. In general, I have nothing to offer except for the one precept whose reward is infinite, true cleaving, which is described as no eye has seen a God beside thee. Isaiah 64, 3. And this is the precept of work and of sharing with the community and of additional of adding additional benefit to them on top of any benefit they already enjoy. And the reward will be accordingly to the effort. And exact opposite to this, there is only one sin, which is egoism, also in a more narrow sense, meaning that any self-enjoyment is a transgression. Therefore, anyone who decreases this transgression receives his reward as payment for his maker, meaning that a person should not enjoy anything in this world except to the extent that he shares with the community and with the creator in order to make the creator and the people happy. And any drop of enjoyment exceeding this degree is a transgression. And this nefesh, lower soul, will be completely severed from human society and would reincarnate as a wild animal. All this unless the person atones for the sin and would be put to work against his will. And of course, these things concerning one precept have to be in the form of working for the sake of the creator and not for the community, meaning that the creator has provided us with ways to give him pleasure he has prepared a community for each individual and a cardinal rule that a person should serve his community and be useful to them. And the creator accepts this work and this pleasure as if it the same degree of benefit and pleasure was sent directly to him by members of his world. Here we need to expand the explanation regarding the reward and punishment to the level that fits the masses. But the main point is the necessity of the wise to understand it because only the understanding of the wise leaders establishes and supports the deeds of the masses. I have worked on them for 12 years until I have managed to edit them with a deeper sense and deeper reasoning than any of the theology and mysticism of all those that came before me, as our eyes shall observe. And in order to declare it thoroughly, you should send to me a group of wise people who are well versed with your system and let them examine and find out. To explain this, I have prepared two approaches. One way follows theoretical theology and is common up to the present in all matters. And the second way is according to mysticism based on things that have been recognized by the wise of yore over the past few thousand years. And here, events of our time have paved the way so that it is possible to publicize this opinion of mine to the world. I'm referring to the various peace associations that have proliferated in the world at the present time. Through this desperate yearning for peace, the world is able to accept my opinion, although I'm afraid that they may take this opinion of mine and cover it with a cloth of egoism, in which case it would bring a curse rather than a blessing. Therefore, I cannot stray from my initial thoughts because I've labored and written this manifesto only for you. And now it is really like cold water sprinkled on a tired soul, as I can see by your present state. In regard to financial issues and all that pertains to material property, it is mandatory not to make changes on any account, for there is no difference between people, between the black and the white and the yellow, between the wise and the foolish. They are all equal, and each is obliged to give to the world as much as he or she can, receiving what he or she needs, without prejudice or favoritism. This is an absolute law. As for spiritual and intellectual properties that do not harm to the economy, that do no harm to the economy or to material happiness, namely united ideals and legalities, as well as political reasoning, ethics, and aesthetics, all these should remain national, that is local. No nation should be forced to forgo its customs and preferences as long as it will not harm at all the customary straightforward laws of the economy. In a word, Material internationalism should be meticulously maintained and alongside it spiritual nationalism should be preserved as long as it does not impact, literally touch, material internationalism. My advice, therefore, is that everywhere within your borders, the secular and the religious alike must accept the national and international religion like is suggested. Whoever transgresses or weakens it is punishable as if he were harming humanity. This is the divine international religion that every human being is ordered to fulfill. Otherwise, he will be uprooted from the world to come and he will lose both worlds. Indeed, God allows every nation to keep its religious customs that were received by the great sages, each country according to its preferences and spirit, since undoubtedly they would help any individual country to its liking. Eventually, all nations will be able to completely accept the international religion that is lofty and above them all, the prophetic last word. Whoever denies this principle, his religion is damaged and harmful. 
it will deserve a severe punishment and should be prevented from this harmful attribute. Yet a person who accepts our principle will find that his individual religion, re religious work becomes acceptable because it is necessary that it be validated in order to finally help the international religion. In a word, individual religion must be constructed in such a way that it would be a tool to reach the universal religion. If it becomes known that some countries are damaging again what they have corrected before, and the individual religion became the most important and ultimate goal, they would be punished and their religion would be completely forbidden by law. Do not ask what the benefit would be if we start cutting back religions and war is restored. Indeed, God can change any religion. And with a carefully planned design, this international faith can be fully brought into the midst of the masses when God annuls all the additions that the middle class added to the religion for their own benefit. He revealed this to his prophets to ease the work and toil that the middle class deceitfully came up with for their own advantage. Surely there would be some clear-minded among you who would say, we have already managed to uproot a great amount from the masses. Should we be messengers now to return ignorance to its place? Be careful of being extreme. Do not quickly make poor people wealthy, both materially and in knowledge. First, we should fix the international economy using all the tools in our hands, since the end justifies the means, especially a sacred difficult to realize goal such as this. After we rearrange the economy throughout the world, we can take our time uprooting deviant op op opinions from the world. First, we need to create healthy bodies. Then we can start taking care of good souls for those bodies. It is a law of nature that one's will is not to be broken because of someone else's will, but only because of one's own will. Even when a weak person surrenders his will to someone more aggressive than him, he does so because of his own desire to protect himself from pain and so forth. It is a psychological law that there is no will that can be broken while being the only will working and dominating. Whenever anyone's will is broken anywhere in the world, it happens only because its owner has attached another will to it. And when the two wills are standing in the same place, it is inescapable that they will wear and erode each other. And in doing so, their form is blown, blurred and their force is lost. I'm mentioning this because I find that you are not focusing your work on manifesting your goal. On the contrary, you keep adding various other things you want without noticing whether these drain your energy or add confrontations and resistance. This is the greatest evil, and history will never forgive you for this crime and malice. So why in these difficult times do you fight something that is not directly necessary for your goals? This is nothing but foolishness and lack of attention to your role. Therefore, if you're fighting religion and nationalism, because they directly hinder your goal, this is reasonable and acceptable. However, if you are fighting religion and nationalism, when they do no direct harm to your goal, this is a crime and evil-mindedness. It is like a poor man who hardly earns enough money for bread and water, but spoils all his earnings by buying wine and drinks, and by doing so fades away and dies. It is not enough for you in your difficult war, which is your main focus, and is entirely against the nature of man. When you are part of the masses to work and toil without any motivation, and this, is war, and this war, not enough that you add fuel to the flame by also fighting at the same time against religion and nationalism? Is there a greater foolishness in the world than this? The main thing is that you will perish very quickly, and therefore you are stepping backwards, and your work is bearing curse. The truth is that until now, you had no other choice because these two ways present the most terrible opposition to your method, according to their nature, that they have received from the Burgoys, middle class. But in the manner that I have laid my method before you, religion not only does not oppose and damage you, but is the most effective assistant, and is also the only instrument that ensures the success of your goal in the most uplifting manner. As for nationalism, my opinion is that it's better if it were to be corrected. It should be given a proper character, one that will be accepted by the masses before it is completely uprooted and fought against. Surely the most I can do is to present you with a successful mechanism to obtain the goal, but the work and trouble themselves are all upon you to find a suitable plan and to supply it with swift and loyal legs to spread the word quickly. If this is acceptable to you, let me know or send me suitable people. Then we can work out a successful plan to ensure swift expansion. Yeah, Bergois. <laughs> Bergois, it's French. The word even gives you a feeling of the type of people it is describing. Bourgeois.
Any new discernments after the second reading? Tons, but they must spin around so that I know the Creator speaks what He wants myself to hear with all of you. You know, there's a good analogy though, is there is something very intense and directed and strong with this gathering that you have. And so it's an amazing, beautiful space for seeing discernments and so when in the reading I figured out the line that made me go whoop is about removing deviant behavior from the society and so I apply it to there are other groups or I would never trust them and I know it's all in here and so I have to sort it out but there are other groups I would never trust them to remove a deviant person because they'd remove the person that was going to save them. Whereas here, I could feel that it would be a very well directed towards pleasing the creator, revealing the creator, to pick the words that are with you and resonating at the moment. So that line is very sharp because my behavior is always deviant compared to those around me as I live in the Bible Belt of the United States. So interesting, any thought? Um, can I, I don't have any thoughts on that, but when he's saying the goal of interfering with the goal, it's, he's referring to the only goal there really is, and that's, Becoming the crater, <laughs> revealing the crater. <laughs> exactly. Um, notice at the end he says to the person, and I don't know who that person is, but he must be someone very important if Balasanam is writing five chapters towards him, um, that he says you have to be focused. Stop trying to, to mess around with things that have nothing to do with your goal and rather be very focused and only mess with the things that um, stop you from reaching your goal. To be very focused and very determined towards one direction. Any more thoughts? Um, Zakai, sometimes I, I, I get confused when I first came to um, study Kabbalah with BBEC. Um, I, 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 I thought the goal was unity and connection. Um, and then I hear the goal is Dev Kut. And like how many go, I, I, it's, it's one, uh, is is. Uh, are there different degrees of the goal or is one a means to an end? Could you give me more, expl more expl explanation? <laughs> Definitely. The thing is that even if people hear the goal, depending on their phase, they'll understand it differently. So phase one understands it, that the goal is happiness through receiving, through reception. Uh, someone in phase two will understand it as um, happiness, but through bestowing. So still the goal is happiness, but the method is through bestowing to each other instead of receiving for self alone. And then you'll have someone in phase three, which understands that he has to use a combination of, on one hand, receiving the primacy of the creator, which means to become the creator, but still it's through bestowing to others and um, correcting the world and making, you know, giving people stuff and things like that. And then you've got someone who moves into phase four, where he understands it's not about any bestowing, but it's all about receiving the full primacy of the creator, because only if I'm the creator, only if I've enabled that connection with me and I've corrected my intention to become the creator, only when I get that power can I actually then bestow to others. So beforehand, 
anything I'm going to bestow is going to be incorrect because it's going to be through the goal of happiness and it's not going to be through the goal of absolute power, which is what we're trying to get to, to reach that intense uh, uh, fusion of, uh, of uh, internal power. And then we can actually uh, do much more. So the idea is that depending on the person's phase, which will define his vessels, you'll understand it differently. So you'll see in the lessons where um, the questions of people that they'll ask will ex express their phase are on because the words that will register in them will be different. So sometimes Rav will say things like connection and that's the method and then people will focus on that and they'll think, oh, it's all about connection. It's all about unity. And they, when Rav says, oh, the idea is to become the creator or the idea is to get adhesion with the creator, it doesn't, they don't have those vessels for it to register in them, so they just ignore it. So all they hear is the method is connection and unity, and then they turn the method into the goal itself. And the idea is, as you, and that's why phase two is called chaos, because you're, you're constantly making, um, mixing up the method and the goal. And the idea is that only when you actually continue to advance, then you can actually have the vessels, you can actually hear, oh, Rav is talking about that there's the method, which is unity and connection, and collecting discernments. And there's the goal of becoming the creator, revealing that internal power within each and every one of us. So the goal, the, this perception of the goal kind of evolves in progressives, it, like the, for the phases of direct light or kind of, I mean, can we compare, is there a connection to the, uh, the four phases of direct light, you know, um, Keter, Hakma, Bina, Zerpan, Malkut, is there a connection or can we make that connection between our perception of the goal and the four phases of direct light? So the idea is that when we're learning Kabbalah, we, uh, at the beginning, we tend to learn it as unnecessary, which is external, where we think it's talking about something external to us. There's some world out there, which is Adam Kadmon or Atzilut or whatever. When we um, pass that from unnecessary to necessary, we understand it's talking about something inside of us. But then we do the mistake of impossible when we think it's talking about something that happened in the past to, to the creature. And it happened, you know, 16 billion years ago before the Big Bang. And that's impossible because I can't attain something in the past. And then you turn it to possible when you understand it's talking about your future. So the creature is you. You actually go through these four phases of direct light, which is you go through these four phases, which are called unformed chaos, darkness, and spirit. And those are the phases you go through. And then you pass the barrier, which is the first restriction. So instead of reading Talmud Esestriot as some kind of history lesson, that's something outside of you, you're reading it as this is something I'm going to go through. This is my future. And these are the states I go through because that's how the Kabbalists wrote it. How did the Kabbalists write about something that happened 16 billion years ago if they weren't there? Because they're not really writing about that. They're writing about stages they're going through. And uh, they exposed it on purposely this way so it would um, uh, be hidden from the masses so they wouldn't see it as a, a state of development until they were ready, which is our generation. So before they actually learned it as something that happened, there was some creature and the creator had some kind of relationship to, with this creature, but it's got nothing to do with us, this creature. And, um, but now we can actually learn it as it's something that's happening to us. So when, when you're hearing uh, a lesson of Tas from Rav, treat it as... I'm going to be through going through these states. It's not talking about anybody else but me. And you're going to go through these states. So those four phases are the feeling of being in humanity, in the spiritual society, in the group, and then becoming that unique individual. And once you get to that, uh, that expansive part of being that unique individual with all the previous states of humanity, spiritual society, and group within you, then you can pass the barrier, which is the first restriction. Yeah, and also uh, when you first start studying Kabbalah, your um, your vessels are not prepared to see the whole picture at all. So it's like um, understanding is is trying to see everything in parts and connecting them, and the wisdom is seeing the whole picture at one time. And as you grow, as you grow to these, uh, you move through the to these different states. Um, you start connecting everything where you're able to see the whole picture. Because when, when you first study Kabbalah, if they had said, um, well, we're here to become the creator, you would have been like, a call. <laughs> no, how can I become God? <laughs> You'd be like, something's wrong with these people. 
I didn't come here for this. This is not ready for it. But when you hear connection and everyone from different religions, uh, they can connect with this. This is, you know, a higher level of understanding, trying to understand the spiritual worlds. But let's all love one another and connect and we'll get the answer. <laughs> you can handle that. <laughs> but you wouldn't have been able to handle let's become, look, let's come on. Let's become God. <laughs> And the best part is that um, you'll have people, even prominent people, that still don't have those vessels. So if you say to them, oh, the goal is to become God, they'll be like, no, 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 no. The goal is to become like God. God is up there. We're down here. We do things like him. So he bestows, we bestow. And that's the furthest they can go. They're still stuck in phase two. And you can't express to them, and they can't understand because they don't have those vessels to say, oh, no, the idea is to actually become the creator. Because in spirituality, when two qualities are equal, they become one. So it's not like he's up there, I'm down here. He's in me. So if I'm connecting to the power within me, that means I'm becoming the creator. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, you can see the difference that in the old days, um, the limitations weren't by the vessels, but were by external factors. So we didn't have access to information. We weren't able to, there was no internet. Um, there was no TV shows. There was, no, there was nothing. A person that had what he had in his community, and that was it. And, uh, and now you can see where all the, you know, we have access to a, you know, wide uh, array of information and knowledge, but not everyone is now, you know, a quantum, uh, quantum physics scientist, um, even though the information is out there because our vessels do the filtering now, instead of it being external, it's internal. Thank you. That, that cleared up a lot. Thank you. I got a question. Having said that, what are your thoughts on when we do something so consistently without scrutinizing it that instead of becoming independent on one another, we become like interdependent, like in AA meeting instead of a spiritual meeting. So the whole idea of um, society, um, it's meant to help you, but what sometimes happens is it becomes like a quicksand where we fall so deep into the society's concept of we're all meant to be equal, that it's not meant to be equal. We're meant to, be above society. Every person is meant to be able to use society. And we see this in the phases. So in phase one, you don't say I'm above humanity. You say you're part of humanity. And then you get to phase two, and then you say I'm, I'm part of the spiritual society, but I'm above humanity. So there's humanity with a humanity, with a will with a will to with a will to receive. You've got this point in the heart, so I'm different. So humanity is people without the point in the heart, and the spiritual society are people with the point in the heart. And then you reach phase three, where you say, I'm part of the group, but I'm in a spiritual society and I'm in humanity. So you see yourself as equal in the group, and, but you don't see yourself as equal in the society. You see yourself as part of your group. That's where you feel you're part of and you're in a society which is in um, humanity. And then you reach phase four, where you're not part of a group, you're in a group. And you're in a spiritual society and you're in humanity. And you become that individual that can become an individual also down below and also above. So you can become the individual as a creator and the individual as a person. In Hebrew, we call it Yechidez Gula, which is um, sort of qualitative individuals. Um, and the reason why people get stuck in each phase is, is just because not, their ego is not ready to break out of it. So you'll have two people going, one will be on phase two, but he's designed to be on phase three. So he can actually break through that being part of the spiritual society and actually become part of the group, but then he needs to get stuck there. So he, he, he thinks, no, the maximum is to be part of the group. I can't imagine myself being an individual. The, the idea is that, you know, the group is the highest concept and he can't imagine this concept of him being an individual using the group, using the society, using humanity. Um, so it basically depends on the desire of the person, which will uh, dictate what level and what phase he can actually um, reach. And if he, he reaches that end point, which is that phase four, huge desire to receive the primacy of the creator with all the other sub um, phases inside of him, then he actually gets to pass the barrier. But otherwise he gets stuck on lower levels and he just stays there and he might actually re reincarnate. So it's not for sure that everyone will reach these high levels. It depends on his desire. And if he can handle that tension of being an individual, which requires a lot of um, uh, energy and um, ability to stand alone, to be independent, but still using the spiritual side in the group and the humanity as well. Now we can end, sorry, I'll just, just add on just the last question. Um, 
because this was a setup. Um, but just thinking about the number of groups that we have and how I'll be in this tens, I'll kind of be in that group. Now at some point I have to make a group extremely important and I really have to turn that into my power source. So just curious about thoughts on the other extreme when we try and have so many groups and every day we're doing something different. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know what I'm trying to say. It's different between if you're in a group or you have a group and you're part of a group. So what mostly will happen is that if a person has, let's say, five groups, there'll only be one group he actually feels part of and the other groups he's in them, he's using them, but then, so they're actually not real groups, they're actually part of the spiritual society. They haven't been upgraded to be a group. So just because someone's in a physical group doesn't mean he's on that group level. So you could have someone who is in a thousand groups and they're all part of the spiritual society. So he isn't actually in any group. Even though it looks physically like he's in a group, he's not in that phase of a group. He's not where you say to him, which is your family? And he says his group instead of saying BB or instead of saying spiritual society. And... Um, so you'll have someone who might have five groups, but one group is his actual group, and then all the rest are just part of the spiritual society that he's mingling with them. Because it's kind of the same concept of We've got the world, we've got the society, the groups, and the individuals. We can treat these groups as different pieces of our body and environment. Some we want to be maybe doing the act of filling if we feel that we have something to offer, and maybe in others we find ourselves in knowledge. Like, I just know that I have two things going on. I have the young group that I'm extremely passionate about, but then I have a few friends in these small groups that I can't live without, like certain relationships where I need to be filled in order to pipeline it on. So those individuals are part of your individual level, and then you have the young group, which is your group. And you'd say, this is my group. Like I have, in Jerusalem, I have the main group and the young group, and the young group is my group. The main group is my spiritual society. And every person can define a different kind of relationship to his environment, to his perception. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about each person sees the world around him and starts categorizing and putting people into different phases. Oh, this person, he's a phase two. This another person is a phase one. And you start um, uh, categorizing and uh, defining uh, people. And, and of course, they upgrade as time goes by. So you, you see someone who's like, oh, he's phase two. Now he's phase three. So now I can talk to him about higher concepts. And uh, um, so, you know, I find people in the society that they still will just want happiness. And they just think the world is to be corrected. So I know they're a phase one person. And then you have somebody else who he knows that the goal is to become the creator and stuff. But he, he still wants to annul to the teacher. He just wants to be part of the society. And hopefully that will bring you know, everybody this light and everyone will suddenly be reformed in one moment, in one splash. So I know he's in phase two. And then you have someone who's like, okay, I'm part of the group. I actually want to become the creator. We, as a group, we want to become the creator and we want to evolve that. And, but I know that he, he can't uh, accept the concept of, no, the idea is for you to be an individual and one person passes at a time and not a whole group of people because they're on different levels. And if you can't accept that, he's still in that phase three. And we, we go through this. And in the beginning, when you join different groups, because I am guilty, I'm, I'm in multi-groups. Um, it's like a box of chocolates, and you want to know what's in each piece. <laughs> and then eventually you start, you like the chocolate, but you start going for quality uh, opposed to quantity, and you find yourself okay, this is not working the way I need it to work. Because let's be honest, I'm conditioned to receive too. So if I'm in a group and I don't feel like there's the growth that I feel like I, I would need, then, um, you know, I'm liable to go somewhere else and, you know, do like that, you know. So as you grow, uh, you find yourself growing out of different groups and uh, not to say anyone's doing anything wrong or whatever, but you um, you start finding yourself wanting more and more and more, you know, cause, because you're conditioned to receive. If you're not receiving anything, come on, how are you going to be able to bestow anything if you're not receiving when you're conditioned to receive? And if you don't receive that internal power in order to bestow it, you need a power source. You can't bestow 
what are you going to bestow with? You know, you're just going to give money. You're going to run out of that. Like you need to have this internal engine running within you. And then you can give out this energy to other people, you know, share with the names of God, it's called, um, which we read in, in chapter two. So it's very important for a person to become this, connect to this inner force and become this driving power, which then he can bestow to us and teach others how to become that, connect to that same power source as well. Um, at the end of the day, you know, when I say I am God, it doesn't stop somebody else from saying they are God. We are all God. And the idea is that for everyone to connect to that same power source, that's still uni unique um, power source. And then we can start sharing with each other discernments of high levels. Like the more people advance, the, the discernments they'll have will go high. Instead of just asking Rav each time, you know, what is the goal or what is connection or how do we get there or what should we do now in preparation for this event or another event? It will, the questions will become higher value. They'll become more um, unique and more um, specific questions. They'll be like, Rav, in this specific situation of this specific phase, what do I do now? And it will, it will become more like that. Instead of this general like, oh, where are we as a society? Where are we going? In this like gen generic, like Rav could give them any direction, they'd be okay with it. It's like there needs to be more criticism. There needs to be more uh, scrutiny where, you know, if Rav gives you this answer, which is so generic, you ask more details. And at the moment, most of the questions are generic and the answers are generic accordingly because they can't handle those details. So we need to get to a point where we're helping more and more people clean concepts so that when they ask questions from Rav, they'll be more specific, more determined, more focused questions. And then the answers will be focused and um, specific accordingly. Zachai, what would you relate that final switch where you're generating your own internal power? Because right now I have little light switches that I'm flipping on and they're going great. I've got some that weigh 3,000 pounds. They're like at the nuclear plant and they're locked down and I got to turn that one on with my, what I assume is me practicing my will, showing that I'm going to use it properly for the creator. And so... There's the 625 sensations, and we only know about 618 of them. There's seven that you get, not from the normal channels that you can get the other ones from after you've turned the others on. So at, that flipping of the switch, does it happen gradually? It's completely individual, or when they talk about the reversal, whoop, when everything flips and you know it to me there's many places of that in different scenarios so there's that one big one that's locked until i have proven myself quote unquote worthy i'm not worthy you, that big flip switching is when you are the power source do you, can you talk about that yes so the idea is that um you actually um, pointed to a very important point. So there's two things. We have specific discernments, uh, specific desires, which is called doing mitzvahs by collecting discernments. So I collect discernments, they reach a certain mass, they become a desire. That whole circuit, you know, connecting through my internal power is called doing a mitzvah. And we, you know, they say 613. It's just a number. It's talking about a power like level. Um, and that we're doing and doing. But as we continue, we'll find this one pain point and every person has this one pain point that even though he's collecting you know connect um collecting all these discernments and actually building a more um uh vital and 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 expressive picture of what is that internal power and how i can connect to it and what i actually want to use it for and so on there's this little pain point which goes right down the middle that will be touched slowly, slowly, and be more and more exposed. And that is the point which is keeping you in this world and not allowing you to um, eject yourself into this virtual world and actually go through that first restriction. And when that, and the idea is that all the discernments around cause tension on that individual point, on that pain point, I call it. Everyone has a pain point. And when that pain point has got enough tension in it, it gets released. And then you pass the barrier. And then you start. Um, living in both sides. So you still continue with your body, but you're not connected to it. You don't feel that perceptive need requirement to be connected to it. You've let go. And then you are also human and godly at the same time. 
and you're living in both states at the same time. But it's a gradual growth. You see yourself growing. It's not like you work for 10 years and then suddenly you pass the barrier and, oops, I didn't expect it to happen. You see this growth. You can actually version your perception and give it numbers. Like, so yeah, I tell people, you know, you've got the unformed chaos, darkness, and spirit, which are numbers one to four. And then in each one, you have the subphases. So you can be, for example, in chaos, but unformed. So then you're 2.1. And then you can grow and then you can reach chaos and chaos, which is 2.2. And then you grow up and then you go to darkness and chaos, so you're 2.3, right? And then, you know, then you can continue growing and then you reach, you know, 3.1 and then 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, and then 4.1, which is, you know, you're in spirit now, but unformed. And then you're 4.2, which is spirit and chaos. Then you reach 4.3, which is spirit and, and darkness. And then you reach 4.4, which is spirit and spirit. And then when you reach the maximum of that, then you pass the barrier. So you can actually version yourself and actually, um, by your discernments, figure out where you are and then you can expect the next place to go and, and plan accordingly. So I want to make just one quick clarification here because when we write things down, like let's just say we put some articles together and we start giving internal discernments that we've had, we don't want people to just read those discernments, but like, oh, I had a discernment like that. Like the discernments will come individual and they, I don't exactly word mine the way that I've heard friends express theirs with myself. They're similar, but I'm just saying with articles and just a little fear there. So the idea is that each person, if you, even if you give someone a path to go down, let's say we're going to go to Italy and we're going to go to locations A, B, C, and D. Every person who goes through those locations, even though the locations are fixed, and you're like, everyone's going to go through these four places. They're going to A first, and then B, and then C, and then D. Each person will see different discernments and different things when he's at that place. And that's why you can take a group of people, 10 people, take them through this course, and at the end you ask them, so what do you think? And each person will see something totally different, even though they went through the same paces. So each one will say, yeah, we went through A, B, C, and D, but each one will see totally different stuff. And that's the advantage of sharing our discernments in the group because I can only give you the discernments I got when I went through A, B, C, and D, but I want to expand each degree. So I don't want to just be stuck in my version of the degree. I want to expand it and get the, the 70 faces of the Torah. I want to get how other people interpret these degrees accordingly. And that's one of the reasons I also come to these group meetings is because I want to know how other people interpret stuff. I know how I interpret stuff. I want to hear how other people interpret stuff. And then that's why I think that the people that will um, want to go deeper and not just read an article and say, oh, that was great and uh, good luck, they'll actually want to um, give of their own discernments and share it with others. And they'll call up someone and say, what did you think of this article? And let's talk about it. And let's share discernments that weren't written in the article. And, um, and I see this happening. So uh, uh, it totally depends on the person. Some people you feed them and they're full. And some people you feed them and they're hungry. Um, I remember Steve Jobs saying, he read in the last edition of a magazine, it was stay hungry, stay foolish. Um, and, and that always resonated with me. That you have to, when, when you're fed, it should be um, energy to become even more hunger. And, but to be a high level of hunger. So not just being hunger on a certain phase, like, oh, I'm hunger for a certain discernment but to able to then be hungry for the next discernment and the next discernment and constantly grow. Because the only thing that's stopping us from growing is our own desire. The only thing that's making us plateau is not the environment and not the spiritual society and not the group and only if the group did something different or if only the society did something different. It's our own desire. And it's not that we have to blame ourselves because that's also a great feeling when we say, oh, you see, my desire is small. What can I do? I'm destined to fail. And that's also a feeling for a person. But when you're aware of it, then you can actually grow from it and understand, no, I'm, if I have a desire, if I have a want for something, I can actually reach it. And I use this using the humanity, spiritual society group and individuals to actually grow all the discernments I need to actually pass the barrier. But that is also what the creator wants, that we tap in to his power and we continually want more the moment we're getting it we just want more and more and more and more that we don't get full on it exactly just oodles and oodles of gratitude yes, yes. amen to that <laughs> thank you very very much
Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Renee. Bye. 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 Bye, Patricia. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.